Uh, let's take our Bibles real quickly to Mark chapter 14. Uh, we'll start reading in verse 3. It says, Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, <clears throat> as he sat at me, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. Yeah. And there were some that had indignation with themselves and said, Why was this <clears throat> waste of the ointment? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. And had been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, <clears throat> ye may do them good. But me, ye have not always. Verse 8, She hath done what she could. <clears throat> she has come aforehand to anoint my body for the bearing. Verily I send to you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also shall that this also that hath she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I ask you to help me, Lord. I just ask you to hide me behind the cross, Lord. Let only you be seen seen, Lord, help my words, help my nerves. I'm nervous, Lord, just ask you to help me. Uh, pro proclaim what you want me to here. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> This we read here about Spikenard. Uh, according to the book of Song of Solomon, you can read in uh, verse, or chapter 1, verse 12, and also chapter 4, 13 and 4, verse 13 and 14, uh, this, this ointment or this, this perfume was a very costly perfume. It's very costly, very expensive, very important to an individual that owned it. <clears throat> Yet this woman took that ointment and poured it upon Jesus, upon his head. It's also mentioned here in the text we read, it's also mentioned in John chapter 12, the same story, the same uh, instance takes place. We see that Spikenard had a very strong, distinctive aroma, yeah. similar to what we would use as today as essential oils, that clings to the skin and hair, and it continually gives off its heady scent. Spikner had a unique fragrance, and the, pr the presence of its aroma was an indication that the very best had been offered. <laughs> Spikner today would have cost, if not hundreds, if not thousands of dollars today, compared to when the Bible was written and when it was used. We think about this. When she came and did this to Jesus... It was a sign of worship. I'd like to title this little thought, Give Him the Glory. Give Him the Glory. This lady, first of all, I'd like to think that she sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to His Word. For sake of time, I'm not going to read all the uh, uh, references, but in Luke 10, 38-42, we see that Mary was at the feet of Jesus listening to to every word that Jesus spoke. Intently, uh, she was attentive to listening to what God had to say, and she adored the Lord. We see that also she went to his feet in the, matter, in the time of sorrow when her brother died. In John chapter 11, verse 28 through 32, we see that this lady, she was sorrowing, but yet she knew that God was sufficient in that matter. Thank you, that. Also, I see that she sat at his feet as she poured the ointment on his head. In John chapter 12, verse 1, and also in the text that we've read. She gave all she had. This thing that she could have sold one day for something and been able to retire on or whatever it may have been, been able to live well, she gave to the Lord. I'll tell you what, true worship... This is our thought. True worship or giving Him the glory is going to make you surrender some things. It's going to make you surrender two things that the Lord gave me. True worship brings you to the point where everything is given to Him and you are fully dependent upon Him and fully in love with Him. First of all, I see that she surrendered her goods. She surrendered her goods. As I said, this, is, this ointment was something that was very costly. She could have lived the rest of her life comfortably after she would have sold this ointment. 
She could have lived it up. But yet she gave everything that was precious to her to give him the glory. What's something that you have in your life as a Christian that you could give up? I'm not saying you have to give up your house. I'm not saying you have to give up your car. Maybe it's some little thing that you know God wants. What's something you have to or you need to give up to give him the glory? But you know what? She didn't just surrender her goods. She surrendered her glory. She surrendered her glory. You turn over to First Corinthians real quickly. First Corinthians. Chapter 11. Verse 15, for sake of time, we'll read this. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. She surrendered her glory. You know why people get up here and sing? It's not for their glory. It's to bring glory to God. It's to bring honor and glory to the God who brought salvation to us. Who's blessed our life. She used her glory, as you would call it, her, her attention that people gave her to wipe the feet of Jesus. When's the last time you gave your glory up to give Him some glory? When's the last time you gave your glory up to give Him some glory? Forget what people are going to think about you when you stand up and shout and praise the Lord. Forget about what, it, what, is it, what someone may say if you give up and give a testimony. Forget about it. Surrender your glory and let Him have all the glory. I'll finish with this thought. She found out that at His feet, when she brought her burdens or her goods, and she gave her best, Jesus had a blessing waiting for her. You come tonight. I encourage you. I, I, I plead with you. Give up what God wants you to give up. Give Him the glory. Give up the glory that you think you deserve. And give it to Him. This song reads, Do you remember when you were drowning in the sea of sin? Going down for the last time when you called upon His name. He reached down. His nail-scarred hand and He lifted you out. So remember where you were back then. Yeah. And thank Him for where you are now. Do you remember when with all your heart you longed to serve Him? Yes. But you didn't think that Jesus could use someone like you? Yeah. Talking about these young kids yeah. who sang today. Yeah. But look how He's used your life since He brought you out. So remember where you were back then and thank Him for where you are now. The, ver the course goes, give Him the glory for what He's done in your life. He took you from sin and strife and gave a new start. He took your broken life and made you complete. So take off those crowns of glory that you have and you're wearing and cast them at the Savior's feet. Give Him the glory. Acts 27. You don't have to stand. We'll read oh, just a couple of verses here. Let's begin reading in verse... Oh, let's see here. Let's begin reading in verse number 27. The Bible says, When the fourth, uh, 14th night was come, and we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished... For the day. Let's pray, Lord. I thank you for this evening. I want to thank you, Lord, for how good you've been to us and how you've met in my heart this evening. I thank you for using each and every person that sang this evening and the, the message we just heard, Lord. I thank you for it. God, help us to give you the glory in our life and use me as I preach for a few minutes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I just love it. And there is so much preaching here that, oh man, you, preacher, you could. You could preach for months on this chapter probably, no doubt. There's so much here, I love it. But we just got a couple minutes. I'd like to share a few things out of here. And I'd like to preach to you just for a couple minutes on this thought. Some country. Some country. Let's notice a few things. We'll get right into it. First of all, 
Notice the sailors. The sailors. And we're going to skip a lot through here, but just sometime read this chapter. I promise it will bless your soul. The sailors. Now, what happened here is Paul is being sent to stand before, I believe it's Caesar, and uh, he's, he's been set on this ship as a prisoner, and they are sailing across uh, to, to go over there to Rome. And because these men absolutely ignored what the man of God said, they are now in a storm, and a terrible storm. Uh, this storm, it comes out, we find in uh, the verses, let's see, uh, verses 15 and 16, we find uh, that this storm, verse 14, this storm comes out of nowhere. It just, it, it just happens in the moment of time. And this ship is now caught in this storm. The Bible describes it as a tempestuous storm, uh, a, a, temp, a tempestuous wind. It says that the ship was caught and could not bear up under the wind. They ran into an island. This ship was very, excuse me, this might slow down. All right. It was a very strong storm. And mind you, the reason, like I said a minute ago, the reason they are in this storm is because they absolutely disobeyed and ignored the man of God. And I want to say, this isn't the whole message, but I want to say, if you, if you just ignore what the preacher tells you, and I realize the preacher is not God. He doesn't know everything, but he knows more than most of us do. And if you ignore what the man of God says, I promise you, in a moment of time, you're going to find your life in a wreck. I promise you. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to hurt the Spirit. But I'm telling you, when you ignore the man of God nothing good will come from it yeah it might seem good for a little bit the south wind might blow softly for a couple weeks but I promise you somewhere down the line you're going to find your life in a wreck because you dis dishonored and you, didn't, you just ignored the man of God I promise you it will happen I've seen it in too many of my friends lives I've seen it in too many lives I promise you when, you when you don't listen to the man of God you will find yourself in trouble and so it's not far fetched to say that this storm is their fault if they had listened to Paul and just stayed there everything would have been fine but Nonetheless, they are in this storm. Notice a couple of things. Notice their scheme in verse 12. Here's what they say. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, there's always an excuse for, for disobeying the man of God. They, people always have an excuse for, just, for, their, just for, for their disobedience and dishonoring God is really what it is. There's always a convenient excuse. It's just staying here doesn't make sense. And you know, following God doesn't always make sense. But they say it doesn't make sense to stay here. Let's, let's, let's just go down here to Phoenix. And Lazia, where Euphemus means a palm tree. Preacher, we don't want it so hard. We just want to relax a little bit. I promise it's not the whole message, but just you, you understand what I'm saying. They're saying it doesn't make sense. We don't want to stay. It just doesn't make sense, man of God. So we're going to do what we want to do. And we notice their security in verse 13. The south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose. It might be okay for a little bit. They sailed close by Crete. Now I've got a question for you. What ship ever sails out of its way on a trip? Crete was out of the way. Yep. What ship ever sails out of its way to stay close to an island? Wow. Well, just in case that old man was right. We'll be able to swing over there to Crete, and you know, we can fix it ourselves. It'll be fine. But we find that's not the way it worked out. And our plans, when we dishonor God... They never work out like you think they're going to. It's not the whole message, but if you would understand, it just down the road, it'll save you some trouble. Listen to the man of God. He has a touch of God in his life, and he knows what he's saying. We notice the sailors. I've got to move on. I promise it's going to get better. I promise, I promise. We see the sailors. But then we see the servant. Paul is on this ship, and because of these men's foolishness, because of their foolishness, now Paul is in this same storm. And by the way, when you dishonor the man of God and you disobey God, you put others' lives at risk, by the way. Wow. Amen right there. Wow. But Paul is in this storm now too. And let's just put ourselves in his, his shoes for a minute. If they would have just listened to what he said, he wouldn't be in this situation. Wow. Wow. But here is Paul's in a storm. And I want to say, if you find yourself in a storm, sometimes it's our fault. But just because you're having a hard time in life, it does not mean you're out of the will of God. Paul was right in the middle of God's will right here and he was in a storm but it wasn't even his fault so if anybody had a reason to be upset about it certainly Paul did but he didn't thank God for that the servant we see his trouble it's not his fault that he's in this storm but we see his trust in verse 21 he said but after a long absence Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said sirs told you so you should have hearkened unto me and not sailed loose from Crete verse 22 now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life but of this did before for there stood by me this not the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve we say in verse 24 I believe it is Paul said fear not Paul believed God and trusted God that he was going to bring him through this and I want to say also just have faith in God I promise you're going to make it through I promise you're going to make it through 
So we see the sailors, we see the servant. But I want to see this one for just a, just a minute or two. There's a Savior on board this ship. You see, in the darkness of this storm... In all of these negative things going against Paul and his ministry, and all of this terrible mess, and all of this consequence, and just awful things going on, in the midst of all these sailors, in the midst of this man of God, there was somebody else on board this ship the whole time they were sailing. The whole time there was someone else on board, but you know what? He wasn't just on board, he had control over everything that was going on. The pres in verse I see the presence of God. Paul said, There stood by me this night the angel of God. And I'm thankful that in the darkest times of my life when I can't see anyone else, when nothing makes sense, there is someone by my side. I can feel his presence. I feel his love. I feel his mercy on my life. And I thank God for that. The presence of God. We see his posture. He said, There stood by me. When you stand up, you're ready to get into action. I'm thankful that when I'm in hard times of my life, God is He's not sitting down. He's standing by my side, ready to help me out. Thank God for that. I see his his position. He said he stood by me. I'm thankful I serve a personal God who is with me. Thank God. Amen. Yeah, he's preacher's God. He's the deacon's God. He's the full-time Christian service worker's God. But he's my God and he's by my side and he's by your side. It doesn't matter what's going on. He's with you by your side. I promise you he'll be there. The old songwriter said standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. His position, He is with us. I see His point in time. He said, there, he said, there stood by me this night. I'm thankful that He's a very present help in time of trouble. Amen. Just when I need Him, Jesus is near. This night, He was right on time. But it was in the darkest time of night that He was right there by His side. Then I see His possession. He said, there stood by me this, angel, uh, this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. What am I saying is, Paul belonged to God. And if you're a child of God, you do too. He's got you, as my dad said this morning, in the hollow of his hand, and no man can pluck you out. The worst storm can come in your life, physical, emotionally, spiritually, the worst storm can come in your life. And if you're rooted and grounded in Christ, nothing's going to happen, I promise you. God has got you. He takes care of his servants, I promise you. It may, you may think he's running a little late, I promise you. He'll be right on time. Amen. Preacher, I'll never forget the message you preached in Michigan a few months ago about God touching your bread. And you said sometimes, uh, something to the effect of it doesn't, sometimes doesn't make sense, you don't know what God's doing, but he comes through right on time, I promise you. He will every time. And the song says, just when you think your world is falling apart, you'll find he's holding your world in his hand. Can I encourage you this evening? God's got this. God's in control. It doesn't matter what's going on. I understand we have hard times, troubles come, but... God is there and he's got control of it. One more thing and I'm done. We see the sailors, we see the servant, we see the, uh, we see the Savior. But then we see the spot. All right? Man, we could preach here for a while. Man, this is good stuff right here. But in verse 27 says, About midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. There's a lot I'd like to say here, but I'll just focus on those last two words. Some country. I realize the place they landed on was not a type of heaven, but I believe there could be a parallel made. Because I'm telling you, we're on this ship of life, if you will, we're on the waters of life, and, and uh, sometimes it gets dark, sometimes it gets stormy. But I'm telling you, keep your eyes on Him and keep moving forward because we are nearing some country. Some country. Now, I'm telling you, heaven is some country. Now, real quickly, and I'm done. I promise I'm done. Uh, we're in Kentucky. I guess this is the South. I guess yeah, technically, we've been in Pennsylvania from June, New Jersey. So forgive me. I'd forget what the South and what isn't. I miss, miss down here. Anyway, some country that can be in our vernacular. I'm not really a Southerner, but I, I mean, I've kind of made myself because I can't stand people up there. By the, I'm just, I'm sorry, but I just, people up there are weird, man. I love them so much, but they're just, they're just different up there. All right, but uh, that's, I'm sorry. But that can be some southern talk, all right? Some country. So if I ask, if I ask Preacher Fisher, I'm just kidding, Preacher Foster, if I ask Pastor, if I ask Pastor, hey, Preacher, what do you think about this restaurant? Just some random restaurant. What do you think about that? And if he looked at me and said, oh, brother, that's, that's some restaurant, then he wouldn't have to say another word. I knew exactly what you're saying right there, Preacher. It can speak of its, its location. Okay, where, hey, brother, do you know where this country is? Oh, it's somewhere. It's some country. I don't know where it is. It speaks of its location. We don't know where it is. But like I said, it can also speak of a description. 
If I ask, you know this restaurant? So that's some restaurant. He don't have to say another word. I know exactly what he's saying. I'm telling you, it seems dark now, but I promise you we are drawing near to some country. And it's some country. I don't know where it's at. I've never seen it. I can see it by the eye of faith, thank God. I've never been there, but I promise you one day I'm going. And you know what? Beyond that, but the way the Bible describes it to me, it's just a little glimpse. But I'm telling you, it's some country. I've never seen it, but it's a beautiful place. And I promise you, stay on the ship. Stay faithful. Keep your head up because we are nearing some country. Book of Mark chapter number 6 tonight. We'll begin reading in verse number 30 if you would. And when they knew, they say, five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. And we thank you for the good opportunity you've given us to be in your house. And Father, I pray... Lord, I need you tonight. And Lord, I pray that you wouldn't let me stand up here by myself. Lord, that you'd be with me. Lord, I need your touch. And I pray that you'd guide my tongue and help my mind to be clear and be able to say the things that you laid on my heart. And Lord, I love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. I'm interested in this passage of Scripture, chapter number 6, verses number 30 through verse number 43. We find in this passage of Scripture, there is a big list of things that are going on. There's a lot going on in this chapter. and But I'm very interested in the desert place that's mentioned three times in this chapter. As I began to look through my Bible, I noticed that many people experienced a desert place or a wilderness place in their life. Moses was a man of God that had a desert place. The children of Israel had a desert place. We know that John the Baptist had a desert. Jesus himself had a wilderness or a desert experience. And in Mark chapter number 6, we find the desert place that is given to the disciples. If we go back and look at the beginning part of this chapter, I'm interested in this desert place and the circumstances that surround this desert place. There's really a lot going on. And if you look back into verse number 14, you'll find that that begins a list of problems in this chapter. If you look, you'll go back and you'll find a man that is in power, that is a wicked man. We know that Herod is the king at this point in time. And he was a wicked and ungodly man. He was the man that was in control of the government in this, uh, in this time. And we find that he was a wicked man. He took uh, his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. And we understand that the Scripture tells us in, in uh, great detail that he was pleased with the sensual dancing of his very own stepdaughter. We have a man that is a wicked man on the throne. A wicked man in power that uh, weighs on the heart of Christians. We find that there is a man of God that has been put to death. The Bible tells us that John the Baptist was beheaded and the disciples came to Jesus talking about this particular man of God and we know that that must have struck the hearts of the disciples because they heard Jesus say there's never been another man greater than John the Baptist from the womb of a woman. We know that God or Jesus held John the Baptist as a great man of God. So we find that there's discouragement. We find that there's evil present. But now the disciples have been out. They've been serving. They've been giving. They've been teaching. They've been preaching. And they come back and, they, and Jesus says, Hey, we're going to go on a little vacation, if you will. We're going to go apart into a desert place. The Bible says that there follows them a great multitude of people. So now the time that they've been given to kind of rest for a little while has been taken up by now serving and giving and working once again. I don't know about you, but there's been many times in my life where I feel like I just keep giving and I keep giving and I keep giving. And we live in a day and hour that is wicked. We live in a day and hour that uh, is full of uncertainty. Our country is going down a drain in a hurry. We understand that all of these things weigh all on our hearts the circumstances of our lives and the and the responsibilities that we have uh, coupled with this desert place in our life can weigh heavy on us many times 
And that's the position that the disciples are in. They're taken apart into a desert place. The Bible says it's a desert place three times in the Word of God. The desert place described in this chapter is a solitary place. It is lonely. It is desolate and isolated. It is uninhabitable. A place where nothing grows. It is a deserted wilderness. It's a dry place. There's no water here. There's no life here. There's nothing here. Have you ever felt that way in your Christian life? Where you've been working and you've been serving and you've been doing your responsibilities trying to live a good Christian life but it feels like you're really not getting anywhere you feel like you're in a desert place that's where the disciples are right now and I dare say that's where a lot of believers are today we live in a day and hour that is full like we've already talked about I won't I won't uh, belabor the point but we live in a day of uncertainty live in a time where the heat if you will is turned up on the believer I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been in a desert place in my life where it feels like I can't hardly get anything out of my Bible reading. I feel like serving the Lord really doesn't give me as much joy as it used to. I feel like I've been trying and trying and giving and working, but I don't feel like anything's getting accomplished. I say you, you've probably been there too. But I want to give you some things that, that the Lord Jesus points out to His disciples in the Scripture that helps them survive the desert place that helps them survive this place and this time in their life of stress. Look with me in verse number 39. I want you to see what the Bible says. The Bible says this, And He commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. Notice what the Lord did. He pointed and directed the disciples' attention to what was around them. Where are the disciples at, preacher? They're in a desert place. They're in a place that is defined by a place where nothing grows. But here in this desert, Jesus says, Hey, disciples, look over there. There's some green grass. And can I just say, in my hour of need, and in my time of dry and thirsty hours, I find that there is grass in my desert. There, is, there are things that God has put in my life that I do not deserve but He has put there. There are things in my life that I could never produce on my own but because of the good grace of God there is grass in my desert. I thank God for the grass in my desert tonight. I thank God that I can look back at a time when God reached down. No, He reached way down for me. I thank God that He saved my soul. Hey, friend, that is grass in in your desert you look around at the good things in your life the family that you have the wife that you prayed for the children that you've been allowed to raise up in church friend that is grass in your desert we get to come to the house of God and sit under the preaching of the word of God friend that is grass in your desert I thank God for the good things in my life here they are in a desert place a place defined by there nothing grows there and can I just say there's nothing in my life that could produce anything good but God has put some grass in my life I thank God for the grass in my desert can we can I just say this we need a revival of remembering the little things we go on about the big problems we go on about the big burdens but there are some things in our life that God has put there that we ought to remember and thank God for the grass in our desert I don't know about you but I thank God for the times in my life when I felt like I was whole alone and God pointed out some grass in my life I thank God for the grass in my desert then I want you to see very quickly and I'll be done he directs their attention into what will astound them see God tells the disciples give them to eat You know what the disciples had to do? They had to say, Lord, we don't have anything to give them. I don't know about you, but I've come into church sometimes. And I've been on the schedule to sing, or maybe I've been on the schedule to preach. And I feel like I don't have anything to give. I've been giving, and I've been giving. And I've been pouring, and I've been investing my life into other people. But I haven't really received anything. I haven't really gotten anything. And that's where the disciples were. They've been giving, and they've been giving, and they've been working, and they've been serving. So what does Jesus tell them to do? He says, hey, give them to eat. And they said, Lord, we don't have anything to give them. And 
so you know what they had to do? They had to get real close to Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He said, hey, you don't worry about giving me anything. I'll give you something to give to them. And I thank God that there's been times in my life and in the ministry where I feel like I've got nothing to give. But I, I scooch up close to the Lord and He gives me something to give to others. He gives me uh, something in my soul to be able to pour out to other people. I thank God for that. And you know what? What They would have never seen the miracle preacher if they would have quit. If they had given up, they'd have never seen the miracle. You know what the Bible says over in the book of John, chapter number 2? This is Jesus' first miracle. We understand this is the first time that Jesus ever did anything miraculous uh, that, that is recorded in the Scripture. There at a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes over and he says, Jesus... We don't have any more wine. They've done run out of wine for this marriage uh, uh, celebration. So Jesus says, Mary, what do you want me to do? And Jesus told the servants, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you do. So the servants uh, did exactly what Jesus said. They began to fill pots with water. And as they began to pour it out, the Bible says that water was changed into wine. You know what the Bible also says? It says that they brought it to the governor of the feast. And the governor knew not whence it came. But if you look in little parentheses in that verse, the Bible says, but the servants which drew the water knew. Can I just tell you, if you give up, you're going to miss the miracle. Anybody can see the product of the miracle. Everybody can recognize that a miracle has taken place. But only the servants get to see the process of the miracle. It was the servants that poured out the water and watched it changed into wine. It was the servants that took a little piece of bread and brought broke it off and gave it to someone. And they looked back and there was more bread to give. It was the servants that got to watch the miracle. Can I just, can I just encourage you tonight, don't give up. Don't quit. Because you don't miss the miracle if you do. There are some lessons that the Lord gives us to help us survive in the desert place. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.